Some people take the position that the BLA came out of the Black Panther Party. There are other people who take the position that the concept of the BLA was long before the Black Panther Party. Uh, I think that the BLA has some of its manifestations, not all of them, in Deacons for Defense. They came out of Bogalusa, Louisiana. Uh, some, of the, some, of, some, of, some of it can be found in uh, Robert Williams, uh, Monroe, North Carolina, you know, where black people you know, took up arms and defended themselves. Some go back to Nat Turner. You know, Denmark Vest and the slave rebellions, you know. We like to think that there was a black liberation army from the time that black people stepped foot on the shores of North America. Um, but to answer the question in more contemporary times, I would take the position that the BLA arose out of the Black Panther Party. And that rise came about uh, due to the counterintelligence program that was uh, ways against the Black Panther Party and other segments of the Black Liberation Movement. Uh, the BLA was um, an organization. I take the position that the BLA came about, the Black Panther Party gave birth to the contemporary Black Liberation Army. This was a very difficult birth, meaning that the BLA was born in blood. Uh, it was premature, but, but the conditions of the time and the split within the Black Panther Party made us have to move the way we started moving. But uh, if we had had more time, you know, I think that uh, we could have did a much better job in terms of developing the Black Liberation Army. Well, it was two major factors. I mean, it all stemmed from the counterintelligence program. It, uh, once J. Edgar Hoover started waging war against the party, uh, a lot of things started to happen. A lot of Panthers started getting framed up on trumped up charges, sentenced to long prison sentences. There was a lot of conspiracy cases going on during that time. Uh, Panther 21 case, which involved Sunday Out and uh, a number of other Panthers. Uh, there were killings taking place through the government, you know, Fred Hampton. Uh, uh, kind of intelligence program of us organization, putting, putting us and the Panthers against each other, alleged to the death of Bunchy Carter and John Huggins at UCLA. Uh, even the shootout with Bobby Hutton and whatnot, uh, manifestation can be found within the kind of intelligence program. Uh, so those were some of the conditions that uh, forced people to have to go underground. the ground. And then there was a split within the Black Panther Party which we now take the position that much of that was orchestrated by the counterintelligence program. It was exploited, and it started pitting Panthers against each other. And, uh, you know, people didn't feel safe, you know. A lot of people, this split uh, caused a number of Panthers and chapters around the country to be expelled. I just want to clarify uh, some things uh, in regards to the split. There are those who take the position that it was the East-West Coast split, but the split was much deeper than the East-West Coast thing. We need to be real clear on that. Uh, New York uh, Panther 21 was on trial. They were expelled from the Black Panther Party. Now that's prior to the New York chapter being expelled. They expelled, the, uh, the Panther 21 was expelled, and then later the chapter was expelled. But not only did, uh, and that's New York being on the East Coast, but uh, also the L.A. chapter was expelled. It's a West Coast thing. Uh, Geronimo Pratt was expelled from the Black Panther Party. So you had leadership here on the East Coast of the Black Panther Party on the East Coast being expelled from the party, while the uh, Panther uh, uh, chapter was left intact for a short period of time before they were expelled. Uh, you had people on the East Coast uh, decided to go with Huey. For example, the Baltimore chapter, they went with the West Coast. So it was not, the, the split was much deeper than the East-West Coast thing. It had a lot, a lot to do with uh, the leadership of the party at that time. It had a lot to do with uh, police repression that brought this about. Uh, the split in part was brought about due to the counterintelligence program. And due to the pressures that the counterintelligence program was placing upon the party, there were those in leadership, and some of their thinking was that they wanted to 
de-radicalized the Black Panther Party. Uh, they uh, took on reformist, uh, you know, things that they were doing in terms of uh, organizing the masses of people. Uh, they're those that say that the Black Panther Party uh, existed for 16 years, from 66 to 82 or 83. And then there are those who say that the party existed as a revolutionary organization from 1966 to 1971. And in 71, well, that was when New York chapter was expelled and whatnot. We on the East Coast, not, well, I won't say East Coast, we were here in New York. We uh, had a very short run in the Black Panther Party. The party came to New York in the spring of 1968. And, and, and by the summer of 71, it was over with for us. You know, we had a three year run in the Black Panther Party. But it was a very intense three years, very, very intense. I mean, we crowded, I would say, 30 years into those three years. And those three years, due to uh, government repression, left an indelible mark among members of the Black Panther Party. You know, uh, a lot of people uh, were still uh, who were in their 60s, late 50s, who are still affected from that period of time. It had a profound effect upon a lot of people, you know. A lot of people are still damaged from that period in time. But you have people with uh, psychosis, you have people who have mental disorders, you have people who are uh, took to drinking and drugs, alcohol, post-traumatic stress disorder stemming from that period in time and whatnot, nervous breakdown, a whole assortment of ailments that came out of that period in time because, you know, you had, what you had, you had uh, young people the average panther was between the ages of 17, 22. That was the average age, age of a panther, 23 maybe. But when you got to be 25, 30, you were considered old. Elders, we referred to elders as Papa Rage. You know, elders was in his 30s, you know, so that was considered old. So you had a lot of youth that came into the party and uh, they gave it their all. They were very committed and very, very committed young people who came into the party. You know, we, we, we lived in a time in the 1960s when uh, it was a very tumultuous decade, you know. It was an exciting time, you know, and we were in a position to bring about some major, major changes in this country, you know. It was at a point in time when we really, really could have came very close to changing this government permanently, you know, and I've never, in my study of history, I haven't known any other time where we came that close to bringing about a revolution in the United States, you know, which would have affected our lives, we'd have been in a much better place today. I would think that in the beginning, that uh, Bobby and, and Huey, having an understanding of Marxism, Leninism, and Maoist thought, they, and the overall black movement at the time, a lot of elements of the black movement knew that we would be in for a protracted struggle and that uh, we knew that we would have to have a military apparatus to even defend any type of organization for security and other aspects that an organization of that type would need. Uh, in the early days of the Black Panther Party, <coughs> it was the Black Panther Party for self-defense. So arms was um, a very key fact in the development of the Black Panther Party. In terms of its military wing, um, Bunchy Carter, Deputy Minister of Defense for the Southern California chapter of the Black Panther Party, LA, he came into the Black Panther Party uh, after prison, after having met Eldridge and, and uh, Folsom, I think they were in Folsom. Uh, Bunchy uh, was a brother off the street in political terms, we, we refer to as the lumping element. Uh, Bunchy was the leader of a very strong and large gang in LA called the Slauson Street. Uh, Bunchy virtually coming into the Black Panther Party brought a whole military wing into the Black Panther Party. Uh, the LA chapter, uh, they recognized from the very own start that uh, it would be a need for uh, uh, an element of people uh, uh, underground, uh, 
element to protect the party. Uh, they created a thing called the Wolverine, the Wolves. And uh, they function. A lot of those brothers never became known as Panther members. A lot of them did recruitment and other things for the Black Panther Party. Now you had a lot of people coming to the Black Panther Party that were Vietnam vets. Uh, we had Geronimo Pratt. Uh, they had military expertises and they, and, and, they, and they put that to work for the Black Panther Party. I mean, it saved a lot of lives and it prevented more uh, uh, provo uh, provocations and shootouts than probably would have taken place. The party being an organization that had an open door policy which allowed for all kinds of people to join the party. You know, it was a party where anybody could join the Black Panther Party. And even though it had a, a security apparatus and tried to screen out people, uh, that opened up policy allowed for a lot of informants and agent provocateurs to come into the party and create havoc and disruption. You know, uh, I would say that uh, there were Panthers, especially in the LA chapter, who never became known to the public as Panther members who did things for the party a military fashion for the party and, and protected the party. And, and, and I would suppose that, that existed in other chapters around the country. There was always security apparatus, but the, for, the, or the formation of the Black Liberation Army uh, really took off when the counterintelligence program from, from say from 68 to 69 on, when the heat of all that was coming down and Panthers were being murdered around the country, that's when the, uh, the BLA uh, uh, was having its formative years. You know, in contemporary times, we talked earlier about the BLA having a concept going back years and years and years before that. And, 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 and the BLA, you know, why it, 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 it got its birth from the Black Panther Party. Uh, uh, many people came in, not, well, some people, a lot of people who were never Panthers became drafted by the Black Liberation Army. Uh, the BLA, uh, one of the things that I was proud of the BLA was is that it was never ever infiltrated. That's not to say that people didn't get captured and give up information, but it was never infiltrated because you didn't join the BLA or pick the BLA, the BLA picked you. You know, uh, People was, many people was chosen and called and then people had a right to, to heed that call or not. But it wasn't all of so where you could go and join the BLA, you know, those people were, were hand-picked and uh, cadres and cells picked their people and, and uh, were able to function that way, you know, uh, autonomously uh, uh, from other cells. All cells wasn't autonomous, but there were a lot of cells who were autonomous from each other and that kept down informants and I mean people informing on certain things within BLA because you could only deal with your cell at your particular time. Then the BLA had a policy of uh, the cells that I functioned with, we had a policy of that 24 hour period. You know, the Algerian was, we took that concept from them. Give us 24 hours, and we can move. And in most cases, it was less, much less than 24 hours, because we knew that once people was captured, what they were going to be up against, you know. So I mean, and and our whereabouts with our comrades was known all the time. We knew where people was at, and if and if you weren't, could not be accounted for. Uh, that was an alert for us, you know, that something was wrong. And so you know we pretty much function, you know, uh, safely that way. One of the goals were to, uh, to try and alleviate some of the oppression, the naked violence that was taking place against the above ground movement, black liberation movement as a whole around this country. There were a lot of killings within the black community, especially here in New York City. Cops were throwing young kids off rooftops. And out of all these police murders, they were always justifiable homicide. Uh, we could not no longer stand by and have that continue to exist, you know. Our position that uh, since the black community was very defenseless at that time, that we would take some of that pressure off the black community and we would absorb some of that. And at the very same time, you know, uh, 
let them know that uh, there was going to be some forces that they would have to deal with if they continued to deal with the black community in the manner in which they were doing, and the black liberation movement. Uh, the BLA, uh, uh, not just the black community uh, as we know it, but also our prisoners and whatnot. Uh, BLA took a very strong position around those brothers being murdered at Attica. And, I, and if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, there were some actions taken in behalf of those Attica brothers. Uh, the same thing with George Jackson when he was murdered uh, in San Quentin. We wanted uh, uh, all, all, all the forces that be in this country to know that there was going to be some consequences that if you kept moving in the manner in which you were moving. And uh, as our youth would have us to be rather audacious at the time, we took the position that if uh, there were going to be wailing in the black household, there would be some wailing in the white household or the oppressor's household, you know, that, and there had to be funerals on both sides, that, that you know, we, we, we could no longer continue to exist in the manner in which we was existing at that time. The people that I work with that came out of prisoners out of prisons. They were highly politicized when they came out. They had studied inside of prison. They were in formations in prisons who sent them to us, uh, thought they would make good soldiers. And uh, it wasn't about uh, uh, taking a, a raw recruit and having to sit him down and politicize him. But I must say this, there were uneven development in Blah with his political education. Some brothers and sisters were more politicized than other brothers and sisters. And sometimes your politicalization affects the position you may take in terms of making a move or doing certain things and whatnot. So that, but there were uneven political development in Blah, you understand? But we were always conscious of this and we were always, even in, in the situations that we found ourselves in at that time, we studied underground. We didn't just, it wasn't just about guns and bombs and that sort of thing. I mean, uh, we had to study. From the, from the day of the Black Panther Party to the last blah person went to prison, I mean, we studied. You know, it wasn't just about uh, all arms struggle and no study. You know, there was medical cadre and personnel, and there were, uh, there were doctors. There were nurses, there were people who could, you know, uh, deal with trauma, injuries that could deriving out of that, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was developed. It wasn't developed to the, our fullest extent where we would like to have had it been, but we were able to save some comrades' lives that way, and brothers were able to keep on fighting, you know. I mean, everybody, uh, uh, a lot of people, there are those who didn't die because of, they received medical help. And, they, and, and if they died later on, uh, the powers to be were surprised that uh, there were other marks that would have taken them out maybe two years ago. So yeah, we, it, it, worked, it worked very well. You know, but that's in any underground, any um, movement, you, you gotta have your medical thing intact. In you know, or you should have. No, it wasn't just uh, about individual dealing with arms. People in the Black Liberation Army worked on many levels. You know, there were people who worked on medical levels. There were people who worked on uh, transportation. There were people who worked on housing. The overall Black Liberation Movement. Now, we came out of the Black Liberation Movement, and that movement supported us. We were as strong as our movement was. If the movement became weak through oppression from the powers that be, that means that blah is going to be weak. You know, we were only as strong as the movement. And our victories was the movement's victories. Uh, those individuals who would house us and whatnot, they were movement people. Those people had nine to five jobs. They was doctors, nurses, and lawyers, or whoever they may have been. Uh, John Q. Sisters, so my aunt, your grandmother, these were the people that was housing us and whatnot and making us safe and they looked out for us. And these were people from our community. After all, we didn't, you know, come from some other place. We came from the black community, you know, like uh, 
And a lot of times when people ask us questions about blah or the Black Panther Party, or a lot of time they ask questions, a lot of us came into the movement with the same hang-ups that, the, that somebody have on the avenue. The, the sister on the avenue or the brother in the bar and whatnot, we came into the Black Panther Party with all those warts. The only thing that made us different was that we were willing to change. But uh, when we became politicized, then people started looking at us as if we came from somewhere else. The powers that be, they would try to drive a wedge between us and the black community, but we were the black community. You know, that they would say they would write things like we were outlaws and the black community to disown us, which is bullshit. How, how you gonna disown us? We were the black community, you know? And like uh, our support, because we didn't have the newspapers, we didn't control that. But we could go in any bar, any barbershop, a hair salon, and after an action happened the night before, and people would be ranting and raving about what those ladies and men did the night before. You know, so I mean, you know, we, 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 we were well accepted in the black community. If we were not, we would not have been able to exist. We would have been turned in. Very few people in the Black Liberation Army, very few who were turned in by informants. We usually got captured in military action. Not that someone snitched on us uh, over there. We, we were protected well. And this was the wishes of the black community. We, we had working relationship with many organizations, with many organizations, RNA, uh, uh, close relationships with uh, uh, prison movement. Uh, other revolutionary nationalist formations that was out there and whatnot, you know, I mean, like I say, we, were, we was from the black community. And any progressive people that we could work with, we worked with them. And we, uh, we, we, we was about coalition building and solidarity with uh, a lot of people, man. Uh, the Native American movement, the Chicano movement, you understand, the Young Lords. Uh, all people of color and people or progressive people, period, uh, we, we work with them, you know, and, 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 and where we could do uh, uh, actions together, we did that. And uh, we some, some dealt with different levels of actions and some didn't. So, you know, I mean, but like, oh yes, no question. We, we, we believed on the United Front. Expropriations uh, 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 were for the movement. It was not for individual gains or whatnot. Uh, uh, we 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 made withdrawals uh, from the capitalist banks to further the revolution. We had to uh, to run underground. It takes a great deal of money. I mean, you got to have cars. You got to have apartments. You got to have housing. You're moving around, you, 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 you spend a great deal of money and whatnot, so it takes money to run a revolution. And so like uh, those, 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 those expropriations were not done for selfish gains. We weren't trying to buy a house or the main coat of the Cadillac. Uh, we, we had uh, practically taken a vow of poverty because most of us had nothing but what was on our backs and whatnot. And we wasn't trying to get rich doing that. A lot of money went for legal fees, uh, bailing people out, uh, making sure people's commissary was stashed, stacked, you know, uh, brothers didn't have to suffer or won't for much if they were captured. A lot of our time was spent in terms of trying to liberate brothers who were captured. So, you know, it takes money to run any kind of struggle. I think that uh, we should keep in mind that, that Blah, uh, being a military wing, of the liberation movement. And the, the political apparatus that was above ground and supporting Blah, it was their place to deal with those types of uh, answers. But the Black Panther Party dealt with that early on. If you remember, uh, Bobby Nose went to Sacramento with guns. And that was because the law of California at that time allowed you to have guns. And you could have them openly. And you could have them in a car as long as a round wasn't in the chamber. In New York, at the same time, New York's laws was different. It had a Sullivan law, 
meaning you could get up to five years, I think, at that time, for having a concealed weapon. California, you could have your weapon out in the open and whatnot. And so the party in its early days coming out of California, you understand, they were able to deal with that from a legal point of view in terms of carrying arms. Uh, when the legislature, Ronald Reagan, being the governor at the time, wanted to take away with that law, that's when they marched on Sacramento. And you know, that's when the party got its major national and international notoriety from that episode, that uh, them trying not to, uh, to, 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 to prevent them from passing that law. They would take their arms away from them because at that time they needed them in California. Uh, we, we know that a lot of times when we are captured that, uh, uh, in prison, that uh, we have to deal with uh, the bourgeois legal system. And, but it's our job to expose that system, to expose that system for its shortcomings and its inaccuracies and, 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 and its injustices toward the people that they've captured and whatnot. In exposing the system in this country, any aspect of, its system, of the system that's not doing what it's supposed to do for its people or what it claims to do, that's educating the masses of people. Once the people become educated that the system is not working, this is a contradiction. And once they see the contradiction, they see a need to, to do some other things. You can't, you can't, uh, uh, so that's why these trials, that's why when you go to these courtrooms, that's why those brothers and sisters are on trial, they're educating the masses about the contradiction within the, in the judicial system and about why they're receiving so much time as opposed to somebody else doing a more heinous crime and, 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 and not receiving that kind of time. It's the same, see, we take, uh, the, 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 the fight is not just on the battlefield in the streets. The fight is also in the judicial system. The fight is against all aspects of this, 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 this government's its laws and how oppressive they are and how unfair they are. So when we go off in the courtroom and don't allow the, the trial to proceed and we disrupt the trial and we're not having it and we're not coming out and whatnot, the mass will see that. And the first the mass may say, there's some crazy motherfuckers there. But then on the other hand, they can see the contradictions. That's that, what we're talking about and whatnot. The same thing with Sunday out of college trial, the 21 and whatnot. The 21, you had individuals in the 21 trial who defended themselves. Well, Fanny Shakur, she was one of her, she defended herself and she did it eloquently. And she pointed out all the contradiction in that 157 count kind of indictment they brought against them. You understand? And in a two-year trial, the most costly trial in New York State's history up until that time. And after two years of being incarcerated, most of them in Sunday other State locked up the whole time. He did not, he wasn't one of the ones that came out on bail. They acquitted them in 45 minutes. Two years. I mean, you know, like uh, I mean that's I, it, something's fundamentally wrong with that thing, you know. Now some people would say, well, the acquittal of, of, of Sunday out in the, in the 21, uh, that proves that the system works. That's bullshit. It don't prove that the system works. First of all, who's going to give him his two years back? Loss of employment. Names smeared through the mud. They was accused of going to blow up a uh, Mason's department store, botanical garden, the subway system in New York City alienate them from the masses. They, they, they was ranting and raving. Yeah, you see, they was talking about they for the people. They were gonna blow the people up on Easter Sunday. So these are the contradictions, man, you know, like uh, that they were able to expose and whatnot at that time. And, 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 and same thing with the BLA trials. All those trials were disruptive trials because who wasn't gonna go to the penitentiary willingly? Well, we knew that a lot of times there were incidents that uh, where they threw down on us first in terms of these armed confrontations and whatnot, and we just wasn't having it. We were not going to have that, you know. That uh, 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 and, and like I said, if they had to be funerals, there would be funerals on both sides. Some of the differences with uh, the Deacons for Defense, you see, 
My understanding of history around the Deacons for Defense, here's some brothers and sisters came out of Bogalusa, Louisiana because it was a very oppressive place. And it was also a place where the Civil Rights Movement had failed to go into certain parts of Louisiana. You see history of uh, the marching in Mississippi and Alabama. Louisiana, man, especially Bogalusa, was uh, off the charts. So those brothers and sisters down there had to take up arms to defend themselves. They were killing and lynching people and it all didn't make the news. And then on the other hand, the Diggers for Defense was the ones who strung that perimeter around the civil rights marches. When we see these marches marching through Mississippi and Alabama, long lines of people, ask yourself, why did the Klan just run out of the woods and start shooting and killing up a bunch of people? Because them brothers was back in the woods and whatnot. They put that defense around uh, the civil rights movement. And I think it's very, very unfair to them to not have been recognized as such. Because the civil rights movement want to take the position that it's about nonviolence. They didn't want to talk about the people with the guns and whatnot and people who stood up like that. And that does a disservice to our overall movement. It does a disservice to black people. It does a disservice in terms of our history and whatnot. When we don't talk about that aspect of our history and whatnot, when we try to criminalize that aspect of our history and say they're just a bunch of thugs and whatnot and they're off the street and whatnot. Everybody, everybody wasn't being beaten and water hose down and turning the other cheek. You know, we know that from Nat Turner and Harriet Tubman. And if you do a little study, a little further study in your history and whatnot, we know that with John Brown and Harper's Ferry and the raid and whatnot. And if you go a little further in that history there, then you have to ask yourself, why didn't Frederick Douglass, why wasn't they on that raid? Now, Harriet Tubman and the rest of them. Now, Harriet Tubman, that's my hero in that. I, I mean, I love this woman, man. But I mean, so don't, 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 don't take the position that, uh, that those brothers and sisters out there who died out there like that and, and who put their lives on the line, that uh, it didn't matter, that it was uh, just a futile attempt, uh, exercise and futility, that's nonsense, you know? I mean, like, uh, a lot of those brothers in the Deacons for Defense, they left Louisiana, a lot of them came into the North and Chicago and became taxi drivers and melted off into history and whatnot. But it's unfair to the generation to come along now that don't know anything about that history and whatnot. And, and, and to think that we were just always servant and passive and, and, and just dying peacefully, you know, that, that, that's ridiculous, man. You know, if we're gonna tell the history of black people in this country, we need to tell all aspects of it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We need to talk about all of that there and then let the chips fall where they may. You know, I mean, no other people that I know of, that I've read about, have ever suppressed that aspect of their history when it existed. You know, we're so far on to talk about the, the, how brave we fought in World War II and World War III, and, and, and like, but when it comes to, for black people, we ain't got no blood. We bleed all over the world, but we ain't, like Malcolm said, we ain't got no blood when it comes to us, you know. That's legitimate. We bled in Germany, Korea, Vietnam, you know, but like, uh, here, and, and, and we went to war in those places for much less than would have happened to us here. You know, I mean, for much, much less, you know. It happens all the time, I suppose, huh? Freedom to be safe. Freedom to be not be messed with. Freedom to, you know, pursue your life and your livelihood and, and, and without restraints. Uh, uh, we're not talking about integration here. We're talking about just pure, simple freedom. You know, I mean, to be left alone, to be safe in your home and whatnot, to be, uh, uh, you have some intellectual prowess to pursue all that you can be. You know, that's freedom. You know, I mean, like, uh, uh, and why should we have to point to black children who become ex exceptional scholars of uh, going to space. Why do we, why, why, I mean, 
the restraints that they've had against them, they were able to make those achievements. But why should we have to have those kind of restraints? What about the rest of our population that wasn't able to reach those heights because they were suppressed, uh, exploited, uh, not given the chance, you know? That's freedom to me. When a question like that, it is what the Black Liberation Movement did and what Blah was able to, to the extent it was able to protect that movement for it, to allow it to do those things because you're talking about mass front work, working with the masses of people and setting programs in place and whatnot. Blah was not in a position to do that. Blah was in a position to protect its movement. That, 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 well, that was his goal to protect its people. So the movement was able to develop and go on, you know, and the movement, and, and, and you know, the Black Liberation Movement, the, the, the jury's not in on that yet, you know. No, is the jury in on blah, you know. I mean, so like, because there's still a manifestation and, 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 uh, of all that still taking place today and whatnot. That's why we have uh, uh, the San, uh, San, uh, San Francisco 8 trial going on. These people, hell, these people in their late 50s and in the early 70s. And they're being taken. So the ramifications of that period of time is still with us today and whatnot. And it also is manifesting, that period of time and that history is manifesting itself in the hip hop world today. You know, that's why you have uh, a lot of people uh, in the hip hop movement becoming consciousness. You know, as, as opposed to say five or six years ago. There seemed to be have been a a, a transformative uh, uh, development within within the hip hop consciousness. You know, I mean, you they're saying things now uh, that they weren't saying ten years ago. Hell, I, 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 I uh, Alicia Keys recently made a comment about it, they needed another Black Panther party. Uh, uh, it wasn't, these things were not taking place in the last 10, 15 years. They are doing research on that period and that history and whatnot. Unlike our times from the 60s, struggle was in all of our culture, all aspects of our culture. You had James Brown say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. You had, uh, you had the temptations. Uh, you had uh, uh, people doing, uh, uh, anti-drug songs during that period in time. You had a uh, uh, last poet talking about revolution and whatnot. Nikki Giovanni and her poetry. Uh, little known sister uh, uh, Valerie um, uh, was uh, Valerie Johnson. Uh, 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 these people were making poetry during that period in time. You know, uh, addressing uh, the condition within the black community. You know, and so uh, it was easy to organize then because oppression was so blatant and so in your face and, 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 and why it is still blatant in some quarters in our community, uh, uh, they have uh, um, camouflaged it. So people have a tendency to think that uh, it's not happening to them. It's like Malcolm did the analogy about uh, you go to the dentist and he give you some Novocaine and you're sitting there bleeding with blood running down your jaw and don't even know you're in pain. So a lot of us, you know, we don't, we don't, we say you, some people take the position that was the civil rights, but we ain't, we not with that. We don't, that ain't happening to us now until uh, he walk out in the street and have his face get blown off by the police department. Uh, he get beat into the semen out there. He find himself railroaded to one of the state penitentiaries with a life sentence for a crime he didn't commit. Um, he, he go before the, a, a jury and it's all white jury and they look at him like he's crazy. And if he didn't commit the crime, he just ought to have committed. You know, so I mean, you know, like, uh, I think oppression and sometimes uh, oppression, oppression breeds a lot of resistance, you know. People become oppressed, you know, people take it so long, and that's all people. That's just humankind, I think. The, the myth is, is that we were outlaws, 
that we were divorced from the black community, that uh, no one knew us in the black community, that we had no support in the black community. That was a myth. Uh, we would not have been able to exist without the black community. We saw refuge in the black community. The black community housed us, made us safe, nursed us back to health, and kept us moving. And when we ran out of arms and couldn't get our own arms, they supplied us with arms. That was the black community. The Black Liberation Army comes from the black community. Make no mistake about that. That 13 year old used to just pass on the street out of that little girl skipping rope or doing double dutch down the block. Tomorrow morning, she may be a soldier in the Black Liberation Army or the next four or five years. Depends on how her life goes and how this government treats her, you know? So those are some of the myths and whatnot. You know, uh, 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 the, poor, uh, the Black Liberation Army have did wonders in uh, helping black youth, black people with their own self-esteem. Because like I say, you know, like uh, when you see that you're being beaten into the semen, uh, a lot of uh, funerals of your people and nobody else is paying for this year, it's, it's like a hopeless situation. That, that, uh, that's demoralizing. That, I mean, like, uh, no one, no one should have to live like that. And you shouldn't want to bring your children up in a society like that. Imagine what that's doing to a six, seven year old, seeing someone drug down the stairs, four or five flights of stairs and whatnot, beaten to death, and then there's no justice, there's nothing, no, nothing happens behind that. That person is being scarred. That is psychological violence against the youth, you know? So, you know, yeah, we, we, we think that uh, even in our loss and those who died and whatnot, we think that uh, 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 it was the right thing to do at that period in time. Given the information that we had at that period in time, if we had no other information out there, then we would do it all over again tomorrow in a heartbeat, the same way. Because we only can make decisions on what we have and what we know. Fear. Fear makes people act strangely. And we have to understand fear. We can't hold that against the people. It was fear. It was fear from the counterintelligence program. It was fear how they was moving on us and how they came down on the black community, certain elements in the black People had their doors kicked in, was not even affiliated with the Black Liberation Army. And their search for us, it was fear. And so we understand what fear can do. If the movement, if the liberation movement, the black liberation movement as a whole had been stronger, we would have been able to weather that storm there. But I mean, the people, the people, man, you know, like, uh, we didn't just deal with the local police department, the counterintelligence program, we was dealing with the Central Intelligence Agency, Army Security, uh, the, the, the Naval Security. All of these people spied on the Black Liberation Movement in this country and the BLA. We got tons and tons and tons of files that the counterintelligence program kept on individuals and whatnot. Now, mind you, all this paperwork that they kept on, and a lot of us, man, like I say, we weren't even 25 years old at that time. And, and so that kind of repression coming down on the black community made people fearful, you know? But again, I say, if the black liberation movement was strong, we would be only as strong as our movement. If the civil rights movement, if other elements in the black community had supported us, it wouldn't have been that way. It would not have turned out that way. We, from the people, we can only do what the people do. We, we don't have the power to just liberate our people, because if we could, we would have, and we would have did it much before all those deaths took place. Um, I suppose that an apology would be in order for the young people, because we didn't accomplish that goal, because like, our intentions were to make it a much better place for those that was gonna come after us, and we would have hoped that somebody like you wouldn't have to be here on a Friday night sitting up in a Columbia University making a recording. You could be out with your boo somewhere, chilling out or dancing on the floor, instead of trying to deal, have to deal with struggle. But we didn't, we, we, we didn't win. We didn't, we, we didn't, 
you know, but the jury's still out. The struggle still continues. Our elected officials, the black officials, and the black so-called leaders, they don't have enough backbone to speak out on those people and whatnot. Obama, they talking about the president. I can't see voting for anybody if he ain't talking about freeing some political prisoners. Why shouldn't that, I mean, why aren't people, why aren't people confronting people about that? Oh, Hillary Clinton for that matter. Bill Clinton cut a loose a few people when he left office and whatnot. Some people for, uh, uh, but he didn't cut loose any black political prisoners. And he didn't free Lily Peltier. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that those people that he did give pardons to didn't deserve it, because they most certainly did. But uh, it's an uneven development, you know? And, and I think that, I think that uh, um, if the elected officials don't start speaking about political prisons in the black community, they put pressure on them to speak about these people and whatnot. You talk about Nelson Mandela, we got a Nelson Mandela, we got Sunday Sundar Coley. We got Herman Bell, we got Jaleel Montaboom, we got all, we got Bashi Hami, we got all these political prisoners across the country, man. Uh, 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 we got Yogi Pinnell, is who's sitting up in Florence. You got Dr. Matula Shakur. Those are our Nelson Mandela and whatnot, but it's safe to worship people from afar because they don't have the same ramifications and whatnot. When Nelson Mandela came to New York, we had to fight to even get to tell him about our political prisoners in this country. Nobody addresses that. Nobody, nobody talks about the American political prisoners and whatnot. And they, if they do, it's not publicized. And they're not saying on a public forum where it can be heard. You understand? In the meantime, we got people that have been locked up 35 and 40 years. And you're talking about political prisoners. When you talk about political prisoners, you must always talk about our political exile because we want them home too without charges. There's no reason why Asada Shakur should need to be in Cuba and couldn't come to her mother's funeral or her daughter's graduation or the birth of her grandchildren. There's no need. We need to be crying out for those. All of our political prisoners need to be returned to the United States if they so desire. Sutter Whale, he'd been, he'd been out of the country almost 40 years. He'd been in exile longer than a lot of us have been alive. That's, that's, that's a long time, man. You know, that's outrageous. Pete O'Neill, of course, Pete said he don't have a desire to come back no more, him and Sean. And not just them, you got D.C. languishing down in the south of France. And the other brothers who were in France and in Egypt and, and elsewhere in, the, in, in North Africa, it's an exile. We need, every time political prisoners is mentioned, our political exiles must be mentioned. There needs to be a campaign for those people to return to this country and whatnot. Because they, a lot of them left here on trumped up charges, man, and that was fabricated by the government. And as a result of our movement benefiting from it, our people. Taking the pre taking uh taking that brunt force off of John Q. Citizen on the street in Bed Style Harlem and saying that we'll deal with this ourselves. That took some of the pressure at the time off the black community. And that's what we wanted to do, you know. And then we found out that when we stepped out there and whatnot, they weren't, they weren't all that bad and whatnot. It's a question of who lays down the most firepower. That's who wins the day. They ain't all that, they ain't all that invincible. You understand? They're cowards, really. Because any time that you get up in the morning, man, and kiss your missus goodbye, and strap on that gun, and come into the black community and brutalize our people and whatnot, you're a coward. You're a coward. This, is, this community, our community, is the most defenseless community on the face of the earth, with the exception of the prison population. We have nothing to defend ourselves, you know? So they murder, kill, rape, jail us and do what they want to do with impunity. So there was a period in time we can always go back to and say that wasn't happening like that. And that day will come again if the conditions don't change. Because condition breeds resistance. Always have and always will.
a good job. I just think that uh, in closing, I would just say uh, free all our political prisoners and bring our exiles home.